Well, in the last hour, Ken had a chance to uh, show you how important it is uh, to really take a look at beginnings, at origins, to understand purpose and destiny. And so in this hour, it's my chance uh, to take you back to the beginning, all the way back to the beginning, as far back as you can possibly go, all the way back to the very beginning of time itself. Well, in the beginning was hydrogen. And at first, that hydrogen was pressed together in some kind of ball of matter. Then, for reasons we may never fully explain, that ball of matter exploded in a big bang that sent dust and gas and radiation into the ever-expanding reaches of our universe. Then, under the influence of gravity, particles began to come together to form galaxies. Within those galaxies, stars began to shine. Around those stars, cold material collected together to form planets. Of all the millions and billions of planets that must have been formed in a manner like this, one is this teeny chunk of rock we call home, the Earth. Well, at first, the Earth was quite different than it is now. Lightning flashed back and forth in an atmosphere of methane and ammonia for, for perhaps two billion years until finally, just by chance, a group of molecules got together that could reproduce and life on Earth began. About 600 million years ago, we pick up the first simple beginnings of life, like those little trilobites. About 400 million years ago, the first land plants and animals appear in the sequence. About 4 million years ago, those first apes take those upright steps toward becoming human beings. Well, human beings are the first animals who are able to look back over the history of how they developed. As we do so, we learn things that are helpful in understanding ourselves and our nature. Why is it that we do things that are harmful and hurtful to our own kind? Wars, crime, things like that. It's that jungle fight for survival that brought us into being in the first place. But we're not without hope. We're already beginning to take control of, of that molecule of heredity, DNA. We can begin to reshape ourselves into our own image of what man really ought to be. Man is already reaching for the stars. There's simply no limit to what man can do. Hmm. <laughs> Hands up all those who think that's a good summary of the opening chapters of Genesis as explained by Ken Ham. Okay. Let's see, ushers, would you please? No. <laughs> Well, I think you recognize that what I just told you is the exact opposite, isn't it, of everything you read in the book of Genesis and the rest of the Bible as well. But it is a story you've heard before, isn't it? What do we call a story that I just told you? Evolution. <laughs> and so evolution, unfortunately, is a story that I used to tell. The first several years that I taught college biology, I taught it as an evolutionist. And it wasn't just a minor thing for me. I really tried to convince people that, that evolution was true and that they would have to change their ideas about God to fit with the so-called facts of evolution. Uh, and just for the young people, I'd kind of like to emphasize that that story I just told you, I now recognize is the biggest lie <laughs> that I ever told. But for many years, I didn't think of it as a lie. I thought of it as an alternate religion, of another way of looking at things uh, that was really rooted in science. And, and I felt as a scientist, I had a part in this, this new age, this new wave of things to come. Christians were always talking about back to God, back to the Bible. But here I was talking about remaking uh, ourselves in our own image of what we ought to be, of really bringing heaven on earth, not this pie in the sky, by and by. <laughs> Well, you might uh, think, if that's the way I believed, what is it that changed me from that belief in evolution to creation? It wasn't just a minor thing, as Harlow Shapley said here. Some people piously record, in the beginning, God, but I say, in the beginning, hydrogen. And he went on to say, give me hydrogen and I can give you the universe. And we can be done once and for all with myths and fables about a God or gods who created things. As Ken's explained so eloquently with quotes from evolutionists, evolutionists understand the spiritual warfare that exists between evolution and the Bible. Christians often pass it off as a minor thing. As an evolutionist, I understood that battle, and I was willing to battle for evolution and to try to convince people they had to give up their old-fashioned ideas about God. 
Well, for me, change came in a most unexpected manner. It began with my first college teaching job. Now, that wasn't at Clearwater Christian College. <laughs> As a matter of fact, at this first uh, Christian college where I taught, I, I told them I was an evolutionist, that I didn't believe in God, but that didn't make any uh, particular difference here. I had all the right background and academic awards and credentials and so on, so they hired me to teach there. <laughs> well, the chemistry prof noticed that my wife and I didn't do a lot of Christian things like going to church and so on, so he invited us to his home home for Bible study. Well, now at the time I thought it was crazy that people in the 20th century would still study a dusty old outmoded book like the Bible, but free coffee and donuts. <laughs> now, those are three of my favorite words. <laughs> so for all the wrong reasons, we took off for this Bible study on Tuesday nights. And just to keep the discussion honest, I resolved to point out all the errors and mistakes there were in the Bible. Well, there were lots of errors and mistakes, all right, but they were all mine. This guy was a pretty good Bible teacher, but free coffee and donuts, we kept going back anyway. <laughs> About that time, I got a copy in the mail of the first books that I ever wrote. Uh, one was on DNA, that molecule of heredity. Uh, and as I looked at that book and my name on the cover and so on, it had a life-changing impact on me. Up until that time, I thought that people who wrote books, especially science textbooks, knew what they were talking about. <laughs> but I'd written that book, and I knew all of the mysteries and uncertainties that went into it. In those days, we weren't sure of whether the DNA code read the same left to right as it did right to left and all that sort of thing. Even though it had been reviewed by experts in the field, there were all of these uncertainties. In fact, five years later, I wrote the second edition of that DNA book, thumbed through the first edition and just laid it aside, so much had changed in just five years. Maybe you've had someone say this to you, you can't take the Bible as a textbook of science. I like to say you're right about that. I've written five textbooks of science, they've all had to be rewritten. <laughs> the Bible never had to be rewritten once. God got it right the first time. <laughs> and so I began to pay attention to that Bible study, and suddenly it didn't seem so strange that perhaps God wrote a book in which he said what he meant and meant what he said. And I, I face that choice that Ken Ham has laid out uh, to you before. Who will we believe? The words of experts who weren't there, who don't know everything, experts like me, or would we believe the word of God who was there, who does know everything, who doesn't make mistakes, and who cares about me a great deal? And so the Lord convinced me through his spirit he really was speaking in his word, and I became a Christian. Ah, you know the sequel to that story. As soon as I became a Christian, my wife and I got along ever so much better. Our four little children began to behave like perfect little angels. Well, not quite. <laughs> Actually, that time of first belief really is special. There was a while where it seemed like my feet could hardly touch the ground. It was so exciting to be in tune with the Lord God, maker of heaven and earth. But a lot of times, the Lord lets us go through a period of second thoughts, of, of doubt, so we can measure for ourselves what our new faith really means. For me, those doubts came in the form of what to do with all the so-called mountains of evidence for evolution. Aha! The light bulb goes on. All that stuff about evolution is true, but God did it. <laughs> now, at the time, I thought that was an original idea. You can tell how young I was. <laughs> I found out since it's a very common idea, sometimes called theistic evolution, sometimes called progressive creation. And it seemed to fit perfectly. I could, I could go to church on Sunday and believe everything in the Bible. I could go back to class on Monday and still teach my students all the old examples of evolution I'd been forced to learn. It seemed like the easy way out. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized those two are really opposites of one another. I think a lot of people, we all admit there are a lot of people who somehow try to put the Bible and, and evolution together, have a... And I think they, like me, have a false, uh, romanticized uh, idea about what evolution is all about. You may think of evolution as step-by-step, upward-onward progress. Well, th that sounds like something God might do. But the evolutionary process, as the evolutionists envision it, is something quite different from what a lot of people imagine. Here's the way Darwin put it in the summary paragraphs of his Origin of Species. Thus, from the war of nature, famine and death, the war of nature, famine and death, 
the production of higher animals directly follows. Even the evolution of cooperation can only proceed over the dead bodies of those who don't cooperate. And natural selection is a struggle to, for survival among the offspring, brothers and sisters, the offspring of the same litter. Only some of those genes can survive to the next generation or there is no evolution at all except for a constant death, 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 death. And I begin to think, does that sound like a way God would create the world all very good? This is the God who in Genesis 6 tells us he was grieved to his heart at the violence and corruption that filled the earth uh, after man's fall or plunge into sin. Well, if God was grieved to his heart at violence and death and struggle and corruption, why would he use violence, death, struggle and corruption as his means of creation? It didn't seem to fit. Why would Christ come to conquer death if death was God's way of making evolution happen? It would mean that Christ's coming wouldn't have any meaning at all. And it's not just a matter of a few verses. The idea of evolution is the total opposite of the whole gospel message. Now, I begin to worry about that. By the way, this is what evolutionists still believe. Every once in a while, Carl Sagan makes the, the cover of Time magazine or Parade magazine or something like that. <laughs> always interesting, not always correct, but always interesting. And he put it this way, how did we as human beings get here? only through an immense number of deaths. Death and accident, death and accident, death and accident over millions of years are you and I, brains and all, here today. And I saw that, you know, it just didn't add up. Jacques Monod, famous atheist, once put it this way, he was surprised that any Christian would believe that God would use such a cruel, wasteful, and inefficient process as evolution for his means of creation. Well, as clear and simple as that is, I'm not sure I could have gotten myself out of that theistic evolution trap on my own. The good news is what? God doesn't expect us to do it all on our own. He sent some help. <laughs> well, help came to me in the form of a new biologist hired at the college. Now, this time the Christian college made a mistake and hired a fellow who was already a Christian, already a creationist. <laughs> and he showed up at my home with a very famous or infamous book, depending on your point of view, uh, The Genesis Flood by Dr. Switkem and Morris. And uh, Alan Davis wanted to read through this book with me, you know, and show me some of the problems in evolution, the evidence of creation. We read a few paragraphs together. I got all upset and angry and irate. Don't these people know anything? Don't they know this? Don't they know that? And I threw all my evolutionary arguments at me. You know, and uh, Alan got me calmed down. We tried another few paragraphs. Same thing, just mad and uh, throwing evolution questions and comments at them. Little did I know the Lord was beginning to prepare me for this ministry. <laughs> Well, after, finally, Alan said, well, maybe you ought to read that book on your own, and we'll talk about it when you're done with it. <laughs> and so I read the rest of that book. Of course, later on, I worked for Dr. Morris. I never had the courage to show him the nasty notes I wrote on the early pages of his book. <laughs> but by the time I'd finished, I'd begun to feel cheated. Why had no one ever pointed out to me the problems in uh, evolution, the evidence of creation? Well, there's a funny phrase, isn't it? Evidence of creation. Even many Christians think, well, oh, you know, evidence, that, that, that's something else. You know, creation is something you believe or you don't believe. It's a matter of faith. We really don't talk about evidence of creation. Well, may I suggest to you that nothing is really easier and more natural than scientists and just ordinary people in finding and recognizing evidence of creation. Many of you have had an experience like this, walking along a little creek bed or so on, and finding a, you know, a pebble or something like that, some little stone uh, that may have some appearance of design. I remember my daughter finding a little stone that looked like a little Dutch wooden shoe in miniature. But as I rolled it around in my hand, I could see that the lines of wear in the rock followed lines of weakness in the rock. The softer minerals were worn away faster than the harder minerals. In spite of some appearance of design, that, that tumbled pebble was just the result of time, chance, and continuing natural processes. Well, as an evolutionist, that's what I was teaching my students, that you're like that tumbled pebble. You're a result simply of time, chance, and the natural processes like mutation and the struggle for survival. But many of you, especially in this area, have had the experience of finding a, an arrowhead along a creek bed or in a plowed field or something like that. And there you see the chip marks go with and against the grain of the rock. 
The softer mineral, harder minerals are cut through equally. When you look at something as simple as an arrowhead, no working parts, still you recognize evidence of creation, matter shaped and molded by a plan that gives it a special purpose. What do you need to recognize evidence of creation? Answer, the ordinary tools of science, logic and observation. That's all you need, the ordinary tools of science, logic and observation. They're simply patterns of order in our universe that tell us they're not a result of time, chance, and chemistry, but plan, and purpose, and special acts of creation. You know who understands that? Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan is an evolutionist, but he knows you can recognize evidence of creation in nature directly. He had convinced the American government to spend several million dollars on CETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, as Ken was telling you about it. Well, now the government, in one of their first good moves, I guess, <laughs> abandoned that project and so on, but they're looking for uh, you know, private funding now. But he, why? Because he knows you can tell the difference between signals sent with deliberate intent, coded information, and just random background produced by nuclear fusion and stars and things like that. When we landed on Mars, Sagan was convinced, you know, Mars had been there as long as the Earth had passed through the right temperature, even before the Earth had, and, and life was just a result of time, chance, and chemistry. He knew there had to be life on Mars if there was any truth in evolution. So he said, never mind the little scoops that dig for things. When the camera scan the Martian landscape, there'll be something looking back at them. <laughs> well, as you know, we landed on Mars, couldn't even find an organic molecule. The place was absolutely sterile. And he decided that maybe life was a little harder to uh, make than he had imagined. But suppose they'd found just one little bit of pottery, just a piece of pottery, just a broken handle of a cup. Everybody would have said, wow, there's creative intelligence on Mars. Maybe they died out. Maybe they colonized the Earth. But just looking at something as simple as a pebble or an arrowhead, you recognize creative intelligence, even if it's not earthly intelligence, even if it was on Mars, even if it was outer space, what? even if it was before the foundations of the earth, that transcendent creator God. Am I saying anything unusual? Not at all. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 1. The invisible things of God are clearly seen in all the things that have been made. How clearly? So that people are without excuse for not recognizing that evidence. You might say, well, if the evidence is that clear, why isn't everybody a creationist? The answer is everybody is a creationist. You'll never meet anybody who's not a creationist. You'll only meet people who are happy about it, like Ken and I, <laughs> and people who are unhappy about it. What do they do? What I did before I became a Christian. Evidence, evidence, I don't see any evidence. Suppressing the truth, as we see in Romans 1. Suppressing the truth, holding it down, knowing it's there. Who's the maddest and the angriest at God? the atheist, Madeline Murray O'Hare. You don't get that angry at somebody who doesn't exist, <laughs> but she knows he's there and hates him with every fiber of her being. <laughs> and so we can find and recognize <laughs> our evidence of creation. I had a friendly debate with a fellow out in California when we lived out there. We used to have, to have these mini debates in his class, and we'd just go back and forth. The students would ask us questions, and he interrupted me one time. He said, well, you, you can't talk about evidence for creation. Uh, science deals with things we can uh, taste, feel, and touch, and stuff like that. He said, take energy, for example. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> He said, whoops, made a mistake, didn't I? <laughs> and of course, I kind of filled in the void. Yeah, there are a lot of forms of energy. Gravity, you can't weigh it, touch it, taste it, feel it, can't buy a bottle of it or anything like that. But we know it's there by the effect that it has on things. The invisible things of God, God's a spirit, but we know it's there by the effect that he has on things, and most especially, the effect that he has on our lives. Well, given that, let's take a look at a couple of things. So I began to take a look in my area of biology, the Morris Whitcomb book, it dealt especially with geology, and the evidence for creation was everywhere. I can't believe I'd missed it all that time and so on. Uh, well, in the, uh, the pebble and the arrowhead, we can talk about the difference between hard and soft rock. In living things, we can talk about the two basic ingredients of living things are DNA molecules and protein molecules. 
Fortunately, both of these are fairly straightforward. DNA is a long string of repeated units uh, called nucleotides or bases, kind of like a, a string of pearls would make up a pearl necklace. And a protein molecule is a long string of amino acids. So we could think of DNA as a pearl necklace and, and proteins as a diamond necklace. And in all forms of life, viruses, plants, animals, bacteria, human beings, the works, the sequence of DNA that you inherit tells the cell how to line up amino acids to make each of the proteins responsible for structure and function. So the cell, in a sense, takes a look at the genetic code and says, okay, there's these three beads over here. I'll line up one amino acid over here and just checks back and forth like that. Well, what about that relationship? Is that what you'd expect by time, chance, and chemistry? Well, at first you might say so because, after all, DNA is a string of bases Protein is a string of amino acids, and nothing is more natural than a reaction between acids and bases. Somewhere along the line, you poured vinegar on baking soda and watched the fizz and so on. So the evolution says, see, I got you anyway. If you just wait long enough, bases will start lining up amino acids, and life will begin just by time, chance, and chemistry. No creator is needed. Exactly the opposite. The problem is that natural relationship between bases and acids is the wrong one as far as living things are concerned. Oh, bases and react, acids react when? <laughs> At death. <laughs> what is death anyway? The triumph of chemistry over biology. <laughs> as soon as molecules in your body begin doing what they want to chemically, you begin to return to the dust from which you're taken. In DNA, the bases stick out along the side of the chain like this here. But in proteins, the acids are part of the chain, a little red arrow as I've got it here. And so these, uh, if you let DNA and, and proteins do what come naturally, they stick together in all the wrong places and actually contribute to the aging process and finally the decomposition, the destruction of life. The living relationship, the one you need for living things, is using a series of bases, actually taken three at a time, to line up a series of amino acid R groups, the groups that stick out along the side of the chain. Now, those groups can be acids, but they can also be a base. Single ring, double ring, short chain, long chain, with or without sulfur, they can be almost anything chemically. The point's this, there's no natural tendency for a series of bases to line up a series of R groups that relationship has to be imposed from the outside. At this fundamental level, then, we have evidence that life on Earth is a product of special creation. I'll give you another example of the same sort of thing. Can aluminum fly? Or in Australia, can aluminium fly? <laughs> Well, if you take that aluminum or aluminum, you know, and, and uh, you know, a volcano might throw it somewhere, but it's not going to fly from point to point unless what? You stretch it out, nice long tube with a tail, some wings and engines, then it flies. We call it an airplane. Did you ever wonder what it takes to make an airplane fly? Okay. Take off the wings, study them, they don't fly. Take off the engine, study them, they don't fly. Take the little man out of the cockpit, study him, he doesn't fly. <laughs> now, try not to think about this if you're planning to fly somewhere after the conference or over Christmas. <laughs> but an airplane is a collection of non-flying parts. Those 747s have four and a half million non-flying parts. <laughs> what does it take to make an airplane fly? Something every scientist can logically infer from his observations, something every scientist can use to formulate and test hypotheses. What does it take to make an airplane fly? Creative design and organization. Creative design and organization. Who gets the credit for designing those things? The aluminum, the gas, the, the rubber tires? No. The engineers get the credit for that. They get awards. They get all sorts of honors and adulation. Yet if you look at a living cell, much more sophisticated, much more complicated and intricate than any airplane, including the 747s, the Concords, and the space shuttle and the works. You know, who gets the credit? Oh, the molecules did it. They didn't get any help. Just thrown together by time and chance. Science tells us, no way. <laughs> as long as science is based on logic and observation, science will understand the evidence for creation, even if evolutionists continue to deny it. When you take a look at a living cell, by the way, what have you got? 
You've got millions of molecules in a living cell all working together in harmony. But none of those molecules are alive. There's not a single molecule in your body that's alive. DNA isn't alive. Proteins aren't alive. A living cell is a collection of non-living molecules. What does it take to make a living cell alive? Answer, something every scientist can logically infer from his observations. Something every scientist can use to formulate and test hypotheses. What does it take to make a living cell alive? Creative design and organization. Creative design and organization. But perhaps the clearest and simplest evidence of creation, don't you like those words, clear, simple? <laughs> perhaps the clearest and simplest evidence of creation is the marvelous fit of living things to their environment adaptation. <laughs> now, there are lots of examples here, but I have to admit one of my favorite examples of, of uh, this adaptation is those birds that make their living banging their heads into trees. Okay, the ones we call woodpeckers. <laughs> now, did you ever wonder what it takes for a woodpecker to peck wood? Uh, well, the answer is uh, kind of astonishing. Uh, when that woodpecker hits the tree, the deceleration experienced uh, is a thousand times gravity, much more. You know, from Clearwater Christian, we can look right across Florida. It's flatter than this floor. <laughs> you can see all the way across the state. In fact, it was just a few years ago, or a few uh, weeks ago, I was watching the space shuttle take off from the balcony of the college over there. And they experience three to five times gravity, presses them back in the chair and all that sort of thing. But this woodpecker, the deceleration when it hits that tree is so great uh, that a slip to the left or a slip to the right and the shearing force would literally spin the cover off the brain. <laughs> so you gotta have a lot of good nerve and muscle coordination here. Uh, when it hits the wood, by the way, the eyelids close. Some scientists think that's to keep the uh, wood chips from getting into the eye. Some scientists say that's to keep the eyeballs from popping out of the sockets. <laughs> Both of those may be true. <laughs> and one thing you'd have to say, the woodpecker needs a, a heavy duty bill. He needs a double reinforced tough skull, some shock absorbing tissue uh, between the skull and the, and the bill. Well, once you get all these parts together, everybody would agree that it's fit to survive. After all, if living things were created to multiply and fill the earth, they'd be fit to survive. The question is, how did they get that way? Plan and purpose, or time, chance, and struggle? Well, I can't believe I used to teach this as a fact of evolution, <laughs> but the way I used to explain it is something like this. You always start with something simpler, a bird that's not a woodpecker flying around minding its own business, zots, gets hit by a cosmic ray. First step in evolutionary progress. Some sort of damage to DNA, some sort of mutation, and a little baby bird is born, we'll just say just by accident, this was a lucky accident, and a little baby bird was born with a heavy duty bill. Okay, he decides to try it out, whack, he throws his head into the tree. Bill is okay, but squishes in the front of his face. <laughs> One dead bird, end of evolutionary story. See, now you see why evolution is so slow. <laughs> well, you might say, well, Maybe it was the other way around. Okay, maybe he got the heavy duty skull first. Oh, whack, he throws his head into the tree. This time his skull is okay, but crinkle, 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 the bill all folds up like an accordion. <laughs> You're still nowhere. You have to have both of those things at the same time before either one has survival value. Well, since the fall, since death entered the world, some of those woodpeckers are doing more than drilling holes to store acorns. They're looking for beetles crawling around in the bark of the tree. Well, of course, the beetles hear all this noise, so they just crawl down the tunnel. And so if a woodpecker's gonna catch the beetles, he needs something else, a long, sticky tongue. But if you get a long, sticky tongue just by chance, what are you gonna do with it? Okay, here it is dangling out of your bill. You keep biting your tongue, you know, that's gotta hurt. <laughs> Trip over it as you hop along the ground, flying along over a low twig, what? Tongue wraps around a twig and hang yourself. <laughs> Some real hazards with this. <laughs> well, the answer for the woodpecker is to slip that tongue in a sheath that goes all the way around the skull, under the scalp, and inserts into the right nostril. <laughs> so the next time you watch a woodpecker probing for bark beetles, uh, watch the scalp twitch as that tongue goes in and out. It's to Darwin's credit that he recognized things like this as difficulties with the theory of evolution. Darwin wasn't that good a Darwinist. Uh, he delayed publishing his theory for over 20 years, was finally talked into it, because he was aware of the weaknesses and the scientific criticisms that would likely be leveled at him. 
Well, as I began to read some of these things, get excited about creation, here I was teaching at a Christian college, different than the one I am now, as I mentioned, but I decided, hey, you know, it's time to tell my students about some of these things. Now, at Clearwater Christian, that's what we want. Teachers putting their faith into practice in the classroom. So I thought I'd try it here. And so I began to tell my students about the evidence of creation that we could see in the science classroom. Guess what happened? I got challenged to a debate. By whom? By members of the Bible department. Okay, at this particular Christian college, maybe I should put that in quotes now, the Bible department was teaching that the Old Testament was a collection of Babylonian myths and fables and that Yahweh or Jehovah was a tribal war god of the Hebrew nation, bore no relationship at all to Jesus Christ, the God of love in the New Testament. <laughs> well, here I was in the science classes saying, no, no, this is a word of God. You can believe every word from Genesis 1-1 right through clear to the end of Revelation. Well, that was too much for the Bible department. So they challenged me to a debate. Well, there were three of them and only one of me. Well, they didn't want me to have the underdog sympathy, so they said, you get some help. So I got the chemist and the biologist who'd help lead me to the Lord. So here was the great debate. The Bible department defending evolution, the science department defending <laughs> creation. Okay. Well, after the great debate, nobody asked me questions about uh, uh, biology anymore. But some of my friends said, look, Parker, if you only knew something about fossils, then you'd give up this creation nonsense and come on into the 20th century with the rest of us. Well, about that time, the Lord did one of the nicest things he's ever done for me, a grant from the National Science Foundation uh, to go back and work on my doctoral degree, updating a major in biology and adding a minor in geology, especially the study of fossils. It's the richest I've been in my life. I'd like to thank you taxpayers for your support. <laughs> now, at this time, I knew I was a Christian. I was pretty sure I was a creationist. But if the fossils didn't work out, I just wouldn't tell anybody about it. Sorry to say I've never been a man of great courage. <laughs> but as the Lord would have it, all of the things that I learned in graduate school working on my doctoral degree made it hard to believe in evolution, even though I was being taught by evolutionists. The science made it hard to believe in evolution, easy to believe what the Bible taught about creation, about the fall, about the flood, and about our salvation in Christ. One of the first courses I got into was a little bit of an aside, but it, according to the catalog, this is where I was going to learn about the origin of the universe, the Big Bang, and all that sort of thing. And so we got into the class, and the prof said, you know, stellar evolution, the, the evolution of stars. He says, that's aging. That's aging. And the more I thought about it, I thought, that's evolution. Evolution is supposed to be things getting bigger and better, forming, coming into being, not wearing out. What we were studying was Hebrews 1, the heavens growing old and wearing out like a garment to be cast off. And he said that idea that the gas clouds condense to form stars, the nebular hypothesis, says there is a problem every time you do the calculation, the gas pressure pushing out is 60 to 100,000 times greater than the gravity pulling in. He laughed and said, maybe we should call it the nebulous hypothesis instead, meaning a fuzzy idea. And I thought, hmm, maybe that's not so challenging. <laughs> and the rest of it was just fabulous exercise in descriptive astronomy and the wonders of God's world. As we saw Psalm 19 before our eyes, the heavens declaring the glory of God, the firmament showing his handiwork. Next class was in fossil plants. Got there right away, first thing on the front row, didn't want to miss a thing. The prof comes in fashionably late, and right up front he says, I suppose many of you are here to learn about the evolution of plants. He says, you aren't going to learn much. Charles Darwin wrote over a century and a quarter ago that the origin of flowering plants is, quote, an abominable mystery, unquote. He said, nothing's happened in the last century and a quarter to change that any. What you are going to find, he said, is that our modern plant groups go way back in the fossil record. And sure enough, there in Australia, you find some of the supposedly the oldest plants anywhere, these fabulous blue-green algae in the south and west of Australia. And never let anybody tell you these are simple plants. These blue-green algae can take seawater and turn it into life. There's no chemical, no chemical company that can do anything like that. Biochemically, they're far more sophisticated than you and I. And guess what? 
Those same blue-green algae are doing exactly the same thing right off the shore where they find their fossils. What's the lesson? Evolution? Simple beginnings change from one kind to another? Not at all. Creation, complex beginnings, things created well-designed to multiply after their kind. There is a change. When you take a look at some of these plants, in fact, what we found out is there were more plants living in the past than there are at the present time. In some plants, it only grows big around as my finger nowadays, in the past grew as trees 120 feet tall. In a little uh, scouring rush, horsetail, equisetum, that many of you know, a little sprig that grows about as big around as your finger, is found in fossils right around this area here. It's trees 50 and 60 feet tall. Not a record of upward onward progress. It looked like things were well designed to multiply after their kind, and something happened that brought rack and ruin, a decline in size and variety. And the Bible tells us what that is, the fall and the flood. Professor Corner at Cambridge University summarized it in an interesting way. I, got a, I had a chance to speak at Cambridge one time, and, and I wanted to meet Dr. Corner in person. But his students say that even though he believes in evolution, he believes in being honest with the evidence. And this is the way he put it, that I still think to the unprejudiced, even though he believes in evolution, if you just look at the fossils, I believe to the unprejudiced, the fossil record is in favor of special creation. Well, even for a man of small courage, <laughs> that was kind of encouraging. <laughs> well, the next course is then we're in animal fossils. And so I warned my wife, you know, I was going to have to stay up late to catch up with all these geology majors and so on and so forth. And, and then I got into the class and here we were talking about gastropods and cephalopods and polysopods and amphipods and decapods and dodecapods and all these other pods biology is famous for. I was right at home. I already knew all of those words. <laughs> they were the same words and terms we use to classify things living today. You should have seen those biology or geology majors staying up late at night complaining, why do you biologists make such big names for such little things? <laughs> the reasons the names continued is what? It was the same thing. We were just studying petrified remains of things living on Earth at the present time. Hands up all those who ever wondered where clams came from. Let's hear it for clams. Hey, not bad, two or three people, <laughs> one of whom's my wife. <laughs> I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> you dig all the way back down through the earth till you quit finding fossils, and guess what? Clams come from clams. In our science center back at Clearwater, we've got the oldest clams you can find on earth right next to clam shells we pick up off the beach. And we love to let young people come to the science center, look at these things, and tell us what's evolution done to clams over what they say is the last half billion years. They look at you, you know, clams are clams are clams. <laughs> well, let's see. How many of you ever wondered where snails came from? Hmm, okay. Not a very curious group, are you? <laughs> but you dig all the way back down to the bottom, you quit finding fossils. Sure enough, snails come from snails. The first snails we find high spired, low spired, uh, uh, spiny, with and without spines, all those sorts of things and so on. And the same thing with corals, all the way back down, you know, clams come from clams, snails come from snails, uh, corals come from corals. As my wife put it uh, one time, the one thing you never find are what? Snams and clails and chlorals. <laughs> Something to get all of those things mixed up like that. So again, this was, instead of making it uh, hard to uh, believe in the Bible, what I was learning about animal fossils was making it hard to believe in evolution, easy to believe. What the Bible said about things created well designed to multiply after kind and the decline in size and variety uh, that followed the fall and the flood. Well, then I got to stratigraphy, the course on rock layers. Uh, my last session today, I'll take you on a backpacking trip down into Grand Canyon, as I actually do with my students on occasion. It will take a close-up look at some of those rock layers. But there's an experiment my wife likes to do right there in the Science Center. She made up a, a little tube of plexiglass about uh, so long and so on with essentially sand, gravel, and clay in it, three different sizes of things. And we had a public school group at the Science Center one time, and, and my wife asked the young people, I think it was about grade six, and she said, uh, you know, how long does it take for rocks to form layers? Hands go up all over the room, millions of years, millions of years, millions of years. And so my wife says, that, well, in science, we like to check our ideas against our observations. So I've got some, I've got some stuff here, and I'm going to turn this tube upside down, and you watch what happens. So she turns it upside down, all the stuff tumbles down through this four feet of water, and in about 20 seconds, you've got three layers of sand, gravel, and clay. 
And so she asked the students, how long did it take to form these three layers? Hands go up all over the room. Millions of years, millions of years, millions of years. <laughs> Uh, well, my wife is a patient woman. It's my job to train her in patience. <laughs> and so she said to the students here, let me try that one more time. In science, we like to check our theories against our observations. So I'm going to turn it over again. When I say go, you, you see where the hands of the clock are, and I'll turn it over, and we'll try it again. So she turns it over, you know, go. And you know, all the stuff tumbles down through the rock layers like that. About 20 seconds later, here's these three layers. How long did that take, she said? Hands go up all over the room. Millions of years, millions of years, millions of years. <laughs> and I have to admit, my wife and I have got so concerned and enthused about books for young people. And what a privilege it is to have all of those books out there on the table now. And I think one re it took me three years to change my thinking from evolution to creation. And I think one of the reasons is I had to unlearn all of the things that I thought I knew as a fact. And it's so important to me, one of the most important people on earth is a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> the next most important is first grade, right on up the line. If we can get our young people thinking right, thinking from the foundations right, th what's the scripture say? Making wise the simple. A little child can understand more about the nature of the universe if they understand those opening chapters of Genesis than a scientist with a string of degrees after his name. And we can keep them from having to go through what I had to go through, unlearning and relearning. It's real important to get those foundations established right from the word go. <laughs> so when it came to those uh, rock layers in the class, I thought that this might be some kind of a challenge here in this class. You know, how long is it going to take to form rocks like this? We, we know by observation, and Ken showed you those slides there from Mount St. Helens. We know by direct observation in nature that huge numbers of finely laminated layers can form very, very quickly. Well, a prof knew that too, even though he believed in evolution, and they often say it's roughly an inch per million years of sediment and so on, he was talking about a layer of rock in class about so thick that it was supposed to involve 20 million years of evolution based on the little teeny micro fossils inside. So I was, I was just listening, taking notes on zoning rocks with the conodonts, these micro fossils, and then the prof stopped. He said, I followed this uh, rock layer down the creek bed, and he said, here was a shellfish a nautilus with a shell shaped like an ice cream cone perched on its tip end through the whole 20 million years. I said, how could that happen? How could that animal perch on its tip end for 20 million years without falling over? And of course, if the rock had already hardened, it couldn't stab its way through there. He said, these things are a real mystery and wrote the name polystratic fossil on the board. Fossils that cut through many rock layers. Well, these are found all over the place. They're especially common in coal deposits, where you may have a tree go right up through several coal seams, several layers of uh, shale and things like that, and it's no more rotted at the top than it is at the bottom. And evolutionists are mystified by those things. Some evolutionists have admitted in print that implies rapid deposition of the whole thing. All of those rocks had to be deposited before any uh, you know, any uh, rotting had occurred in this particular tree. My wife found one of these in a coal seam in Australia. <laughs> and so among the bags we brought back, she brought back a tree trunk. You know, our bags are always interesting to look at. <laughs> Come back from their custom shoes, they're just anxious to get us out of the country. They don't care about <laughs> some of these things. And so these are especially common in coal. And we see how those form in Mount St. Helens. Uh, that, uh, of course, a lot of original work done there by a Christian geologist, uh, Dr. Steve Austin. That Mount St. Helens video is phenomenal. Here, a wave of water produced by this mud flow into Spirit Lake sloshes up the side of a hill, sheer up to 864 feet, shears off these trees right at root level, breaks off the branches, strips off the bark and the leaves. They float out in a massive log jam here. And then as they waterlog, they tilt and sink vertically at different levels into the sediment below. We can understand how these things can form rapidly. No one has ever proposed a way they can form slowly that matches the evidence that we see here. Same thing about caves. A lot, of course, in this part of the country. Uh, all of you have been to see caves and so on. By the way, last year I got to bring, uh, you know, all students are flocking down to Florida for spring break. I brought 13 students uh, up to Indiana in April to go fossil hunting up in here, right on the Ohio border. 
And a lot of it, we stopped off in caves and so on and so forth. And you've seen these stalactites and stalagmites. And, and you hear these stories about hundreds of thousands of years of slow dripping and so on. We were talking about this at a meeting in Australia one time. And I was explaining, like there's a school down in Miami. Uh, there's a stalactite growing in the science lab about this long. Well, the school was only built three years when they noticed that. It made you wonder what it was hanging on for those millions of years till they built the school. <laughs> And there are a lot of these under the Lincoln Memorial and so on. And so we were talking about this in Australia. And at the end of the talk, a fella comes up to us. He says, I own Olson Caves. Uh, you know, I run tours through my caves. And we thought he were going to get mad at us for telling him how quickly caves formed and so on. And he said, you know, you're absolutely right. He says, every couple of years, I have to go through and knock all the stalactites off the light cords. He said, would you come up? and help me understand how this cave really formed so I can tell groups the truth when they come through here. Praise the Lord for that opportunity when we got to do that. Well, that raises some questions about the total amount of time involved in this whole story, doesn't it? <laughs> and that's the one I think a lot of Christians have the most trouble with. Could it really be six ordinary days a few thousand years ago? Isn't the evidence absolutely overwhelming that we just got to believe in millions of years and take a second look at what the Bible says? Well, I signed up for the geophysics course to study firsthand these radioactive decay dating methods. And, and still not really having made up my mind, I was, I was kind of concerned, you know, am I really going to be able to just take the Bible as it seems to, seems to be speaking and so on? And so we went over all these methods, uranium and lead and uh, potassium, argon and so on, rubidium and strontium. And as after explaining all the methods, the, the professor gave us a problem to calculate the age of a rock based on two sets of data. And he didn't make it up. These were real published information on these rock units, and so I, with the very best of the methods, rubidium strontium. And so I uh, just calculated the age of the rock, calculated the age using the second date. One date was nearly 10 times bigger than the other. Ah, shucks, I thought. Made another arithmetic mistake like balancing my checkbooks. So I went back, tried it again, tried it again, tried it again, did stay up past midnight, never get the two answers to come out. So I'm walking to class the next day, and I asked my friend, did you get that problem to work out? No, I couldn't get it to work. So we all slink into class, kind of feeling bad. The prof is going to get mad at us for not understanding the method. Instead, he just laughed. He said, no, I just want to show you the method doesn't always work. <laughs> we could have tarred and feathered him. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the method may work too well. This is the one that Ken mentioned to you the other day. They took rubidium strontium, dated this lava flow in the bottom of the canyon, very, very old, a billion years. It seemed like with two billion years, something like that. And then Steve Austin, some other creations, noticed the same kind of lava flow on the top of the canyon. Mm -hmm. Same conditions of crystallization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't we do a date on that? Just see what we get. So they did the date on that. Guess what? The lava flow on the top is a little bit older than the lava flow on the bottom. So if you take radioactive decay dates literally, what? The canyon formed like that, and it formed upside down. <laughs> Something's got to give here. <laughs> Well, the other evening I talked with you about this fossil called Lucy, that back in the 70s this was hailed as another missing link between apes and man. Since then, even evolutionists have realized we found both apes and man below the level where Lucy's found. But at the time, there, uh, when Johansson found Lucy, he wanted it to be older than anything the, the Leakey family had found. The first date he got was a little less than three million years. Aw, oh, shucks, I heard him give the report in San Diego. How disappointed he was. Three months later, the same fellow says, I've got a new date for you, three and a half million years. Johansson says, I'll take it, I'll take it. <laughs> but nobody bothered to ask, why would the second date be any good if the first date actually checked three different ways was wrong? Then another scientist got involved, dated the same volcanic ash, made Lucy even younger than the original date. An editor from Science News interviewed the guy that had done all these wrong dates so far, and he says, what do you think about this scientist that says you were wrong every time you dated Lucy? His snappy reply, I can live with it. So used to being wrong, being wrong one more time didn't make any difference. The guy had paid his bill. What was the problem? <laughs> and so the editor of Science News wrote that up under the interesting title, Lucy, the trouble with dating an older woman. Mm. <laughs> Okay. Well, 
well, out in San Diego, we had the trouble with dating an older man. There was a skull found in the cliffs above San Diego called Del Mar Man, and a scientist who invented a hot new method of dating, amino acid racemization, uh, said this skull must be 40,000 years old, older than many evolutionists thought man had been in that part of the country. But he had calibrated his method next to carbon-14. Nobody told him carbon-14 needed to be corrected. <laughs> so when he revised his dating method, Del Mar Man went from being uh, uh, 40,000 years old to 5,000 years old. And the newsman that wrote up the article quipped, if Del Mar Man gets any younger, we're going to have to call on the homicide squad. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little problem with taking these dates literally. Well, now, where can you find this information? Do you have to come to a creation conference in order to find out this? This is a good place. Uh, there's a real nice readable book for laymen by Dr. Paul Ackerman. It's a young world after all that goes through some of these things. John Morris is working on a more technical book right now. But you can go right to the evolutionist. This is a page from a textbook written by an evolutionist for evolutionists at one of the most prestigious scientific universities in the world. But he's an evolutionist who believes in being honest with the evidence. And so he goes through all the problems in, in radioactive decay dating methods, not knowing how much you had to start with, not knowing full well that the system isn't closed and so on, that things have been added and subtracted, not knowing what the radioactive decay might have been like or how it would be affected by extinct radiation and so on. And so he says, it is obvious, I would just change that to it should be obvious, that radiometric techniques may not be the absolute dating methods they're claimed to be. Age estimates on a given stratum by different methods are often quite different. Okay, not rarely, not the exception, but often quite different. How different? One or two percent? Ten or twenty percent? No. Sometimes by hundreds of millions of years. 99.9999999% error. If you ask a scientist, can we use radioactive decay to date things, a scientist would have to say, no, I know too much about the method. I know too many problems. There's no way we can use this as a dating method. And that's what he concludes. There is no absolutely reliable long-term radiologic clock. The good news is he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just point out the problems in, in an, even though he believes in an old universe, he has to believe what he says in spite of this evidence. But then he goes on and lists about a dozen different evidences of a young Earth. The amount of helium in the atmosphere is nowhere near what it should be if radioactive decay had been going on for billions of years. This lecture should be brought to you in a high squeaky voice like this because of all the helium in the room. <laughs> but it isn't that way at all. <laughs> And so on. In fact, helium is being added to the atmosphere by capture from solar radiation and so on. Oil pressure. The pressure in oil wells is so great that if it had been down underground for even 200,000 years, it would be all gone. There's a lot of it left. A lot of it's in the wrong place politically, <laughs> but there's a lot of it left and so on. Yet it would all be gone if the Earth were even 200,000 years old. My favorite, though, is carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 itself, it just has a short half-life, 5,730 years, but it may have a lot to say about the age of things. Interestingly enough, there's only enough carbon-14 in the atmosphere for an Earth less than 20,000 years old, in fact, a lot closer to 10. Carbon-14 is continually built up in the atmosphere by high energy bombardment of nitrogen-14, then leaked out by radioactive decay. Well, what's uh, Stansfield going to say about this? What's the evolutionist going to say about this in his textbook? Well, number one, he says the creationists are right about the evidence. Carbon-14 is out of balance. There's not enough of it there. If the Earth were even 30,000 years old, it ought to have reached the balance point, and it hasn't. And so he starts off by saying, number one, the creationists are right about the facts. It hasn't reached its equilibrium point yet. And they draw a logical conclusion. The Earth's atmosphere must be less than 20,000 years old. But keep in mind, he still believes in evolution. He still believes in great age. And so here's how he tries to get around it. It's possible that a greater concentration of water vapor existed. Hmm, interesting idea. Water vapor canopy, huh? <laughs> you may have heard of that before from creationists. When was there more water vapor in the atmosphere? Here's an evolutionist textbook. Prior to the, can you read those little words? Biblical flood with a capital B right in the middle of an evolution text. When was that biblical flood? 
presumably about 5,000 years ago, better dating than many theologians. <laughs> so here's an evolutionist in a textbook that says, I know why the carbon-14 is out of balance. It's the biblical flood 5,000 years ago that shook up the Earth's atmosphere. What do I say? Amen, right on, brother, sounds good to me. <laughs> And so just at a time when many Christians are afraid, and I think for a lot of Christians, it was kind of like me becoming a creationist. It was sort of like surrendering my intellectual respectability. And that's kind of hard for people to do and so on. But boy, compared with knowing Christ, you know, it's nothing. <laughs> but at any rate, that may be one of the problems. But as we looked at it this way, even an evolutionist recognizes uh, the evidence, uh, the problems there are with the old age dating, the evidences there are of a young earth. Well, in that class that I thought would make it most difficult to just accept the Bible as God wrote it, when we're going over the end of all this radioactive decay dating, the prof just says, we're going through a list of assumptions. Our last assignment was to list all the assumptions you have to make before you can even begin to date a rock using radioactivity. So we're going through this long list of assumptions. I made 14 assumptions on my list. And the prof just stopped in the middle of all this. He kind of chuckled. He said, you know, if a Bible-believing Christian ever got hold of all this information, he'd make havoc out of the dating system. So he smiled one more time and said, keep the faith. Keep the faith. Ah, I nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> I thought if it was a matter of keeping faith, I had another faith. I'd really rather keep. <laughs> and at bottom, when you, when you think about it, evolution is just a faith. It's a faith based on the words of men who weren't there, the words of men who don't know everything, the words of men who make lots of mistakes, and so on. Evolution is a faith the facts have failed. It's just so plain. And what's that alternative? When we take a look at the Bible, the Bible's a faith too. It's trust in God's word. That God really did say what he means and meant what he said. But what's that? That's a faith that fits the facts. And we're right back to Psalm 19 in Romans 1, just like we read in those passages there. What we see in God's world as we study science makes it easy to believe what we read in the Bible about creation, fall, flood, and redemption. Hard to believe what we're taught about evolution. So that's kind of the, the uh, testimony that I'd like to share with you this evening or this afternoon that, uh, you know, that's how the Lord changed my life in leading me away from evolution, away from something that would have ended in death, you know, to life eternal in fellowship with Him. And the good news is it's not just my testimony. All over the world, we have scientists making the same testimony. Some of you have had the privilege of hearing Dr. Uh, Dmitry Kuznetsov from the Soviet Union, leader of the Moscow Creation Fellowship. We've had him at our college, and I've, I've been in conference with him. Tremendous uh, individual uh, and all kinds of academic credentials and so on, and also a humble Christian, grateful for the Lord, way the Lord has changed his life. Uh, a couple of summers ago, my wife and I spent uh, three weeks in Japan with the uh, Creation Science Foundation there, headed up by Dr. Usami, who was a 17-year-old uh, man, was, was looking into the Bible to convince his brother not to become a Christian. Wound up becoming a Christian himself and committing his life to the Lord at that early age. And what a testimony he has. And as we went around Japan, it was so thrilling to be able to share with the Japanese that we're talking about the real God, not the God of Western culture, not the American God, and not the Caucasian God or something like that, but the real God, the Lord God, the maker of heaven and earth, the God of all peoples in all times and all places. And the list just goes on and on. Uh, Professor Dean Kenyon at San Francisco State University taught evolution, wrote a book uh, on chemical evolution. That was his area of expertise. Some students came up, 1 Peter 3.15. They said, hey, are we going to hear anything about creation in this course? And Dean Kenyon said, well, uh, some people believe God created it. I guess that's the creation site. They said, oh, no, there's so much more. Here, read these books. Tell us what you think. And then they kept coming back Two key words, politely, persistently, ready to give a reason for their hope, yet in gentleness and meekness. Have you read these books? What do you think about it? Well, I haven't read them yet, you know. And finally, Dr. Kenyon said, I resolved one weekend to read these books, refute them, and be done with it. He said, I read them, and I couldn't refute them. 
Same thing for him as for me over a three-year period. He finally changed his thinking completely from being a, an evolutionist to being a creationist and being a Christian, dedicating his life to Christ. He's one of the co-authors of the book out there of Pandas and People and so on. Here's another list of some of the other scientists right around the world whose testimony is the same as mine. Changed lives. That's what the creation ministry is all about. Changed lives. And if God can change Dmitry Kuznetsov after all those years of brainwashing and Marxism, if he can change me, which is probably even worse, you know, an American just looking for the good life, that's a real hard nut to crack. <laughs> if he can change us, he can change your friends, members of your family, your neighbors, and so on. Praise God, he changed me.